Hey guys, Taki here. It's been a while since I've done a video on a single board computer product on this channel. So today we're gonna take a look at one of the best products that I've seen built around an open source ARM processor. It also happens to be the brother to another processor that will soon be flooding the open source handheld market. This is the new Station P2 from Firefly. And as you'll see in this video, it has a lot of good features both in hardware and in software that many other companies should learn from. I did a video on a smaller RK3566 product from this company last year, so it'll be interesting to see the differences between the two. Beyond the price, the biggest thing that you'll notice is that this comes with a metal case, which allows us to passively cool the processor in this device without the need for a fan. Firefly is pitching this as a multi-purpose PC, and I think you'll notice that when we take a look at the extensive I.O. on this board. We have dual gigabit ethernet ports on the back, surrounded by dual antenna connectors, HDMI 2.0, our DC jack, and a hard drive and SSD expansion bay for additional storage. This bay is great if you're thinking about setting this device up as a Plex server or to store a massive collection of ROMs on an affordable storage medium. The front of the device has a lot more going on when it comes to I.O. We have a power button, a Type-C OTG port, a single USB 3.0 port, two USB 2.0 ports, a control port in the middle, a TF card slot on the top right hand corner, and a headphone jack below that. There are five configurations that this device comes in, but the one that was sent to me for this review is not one that you can buy. Mine came with an optional 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD from Western Digital, and I'm interested to see if there's any speed cap on this drive with this package. And basically, before we put this together, here's a look at the bottom of the board. My board has an LPDDR4 chip from Samsung and an eMMC chip from Kingston. The RK3566 and the RK3568 can get a bit toasty under load, but the P2 has no problems with passive cooling thanks to the large top plate that acts as a heatsink. We will check the thermals closer later in this video. Now let's go over the specs and again, the model that I have here is not for sale, but I will list what it came with. My Station P2 comes with the RK3568 CPU, a Mali G52 GPU, 8 gigabytes of LPDDR4 RAM, 64 gigabytes of eMMC storage with additional storage from a SATA connector, or an M.2 PCIe 3.0 NVMe drive. Moving on, we have HDMI 2.0 video out with 4K and 1080p options, and Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0 for connectivity. We also have gigabit ethernet support as well. The operating system support is a highlight on this product, and there are a ton of options available. This video is only going to focus on two of them, but you can have your pick of the Station OS built over Android, normal Android 11, Ubuntu 2004, and Emulec to name a few. In the box, you'll find a wireless USB remote that functions as a mouse or as a normal TV box remote. There is also a power adapter with various outlet adapters for regions around the world. There are a lot of interesting things to go over when it comes to software, so let's start off first by taking a look at Firefly's custom Station OS. Here we are booted into my current setup with the Station OS. Our main window has a couple of stock UI elements that we cannot change, but we are able to add some apps to our quick launcher on the right side of the screen. I've gone ahead and loaded up my most frequently used applications here to make the system easier to use. If I go into all apps, you'll see that I've already installed a lot of stuff on this device for this video. This build of the Station OS does not have Google Play support, but they do have the Aurora store and I had no problems finding everything that I needed with that. Let's go back to the main window and go over the items in the center of the launcher. I think you're able to tell that there was a lot of customization that went into this build. The first option at the top is a movie library and this device came with some movie trailers installed with the system, which I guess is just to have some content to populate here so users can see how it will work. As I mentioned, using this as a media server is one of the better use cases for this product with the storage options that we have. We also have a section for Kodi on this device and I've already gone ahead and installed some movie add-ons. The Station OS also comes with a skin for some system settings. Again, all of this is made for use with a TV controller, so everything here is also easy to control with a gamepad connected to the device. I did all of the gameplay portions of this video with a wireless Xbox 360 controller with no issues. If we head over to the storage options, you'll see my internal storage and the M.2 SSD recognized here with some basic management options. We can break out of this UI to get to the standard Android settings menu, and in there, I was able to find the root access option. I'm going to enable this to make it easier to do some debugging on this device, as well as have better control over the kernel. 
Before we continue, let's take a look at some benchmarks. For Geekbench 5, I got a single core score of 143 and a multi-core score of 455. This is about what you'd expect from a Cortex A55 processor. I wish we had access to a better CPU configuration for this package because there's a lot going on for this product. I also did a benchmark of the eMMC chip that came with my unit. The scores are about what you'd expect for eMMC storage. I also did a benchmark of the Western Digital SSD that came with my device, and the read and write speeds seem to be underperforming here. I'll have to swap this card into another device to see if I get similar results when I have the chance. Now I want to talk about one of my personal favorite features of this product, the OS Assistant. If you head in here, you'll see a custom UI that Firefly has built around the function of utilizing an unlocked bootloader to swap out operating systems on the fly, and it is very user friendly. You start out by using the Select OS option, and you'll be greeted with three different OS's that you're able to download from the internet as of this moment. You also have options for supplying your own OS files from local storage if you prefer. After you pick one of these options, you'll be prompted to select the target drive that you wish to flash your OS to. This is typically something that you would need to do on a PC, and it's amazing to be able to use the actual device to do all of this. In this case, I'm going to flash Ubuntu to my M.2 drive. Once we reboot, the bootloader will ask us to select our boot drive from the list, and they've made this menu fully accessible with the included remote. I haven't had a lot of time to poke around here in the Linux OS yet, but I have used the RK3566 from Firefly for a lot of testing last year, and it holds up well as a PC. If you intend to use this for the Linux OS support, you should really think about getting at least the 4GB version of this board. If you're sticking to Android, 2GB is fine for what this SoC can do. So we have talked about the OS and some of the use cases, but I'm interested in seeing how this holds up when it comes to emulation on the Android side under the Station OS. As I mentioned before, I'm going to be using a wireless Xbox controller for this, but you could use just about anything that you could want with all of our I.O. options here. Because this is predominantly a TV-inspired OS, I set up Dig as my front end with the Wii theme, and I think it suits this package very well. Now let's move on to emulation. First up, we have PS1 using the Duck Station emulator. These games are running at native resolution, and the FPS is listed in the top right-hand corner of the screen. You'll also notice that I have the CPU frequencies and the temperature located at the top of the screen. For PSP, we're going to be able to do things that do not run well on the RK3326, but you are not going to have enough power to do everything that you could want without some compromise. I originally looked at the RK3566 from Firefly with an alpha build of the Ether SX2 emulator, but I have not checked or looked if there have been any improvements with these Cortex A55 boards when it comes to PS2 emulation. As you would expect, we don't have enough power to play PS2 games, but I did find a couple that were not a total slideshow. Where this processor shines is in all the systems that run well on the weaker RK3326. This is going to be things like NES and SNES using various core options inside RetroArch. There's a noticeable improvement when it comes to N64 using the Mupin64 emulator. Just like PS2, I did not expect that we'd have enough power here to run GameCube, but I wanted to check for myself. The best performance that I was able to get came from the old Dolphin MMJ or the MMJR1 build. Big 3D games are going to be out of the question for you, but I did find at least one title that ran well. Switching gears again, we have no issues with Sega Dreamcast using the Pico Drive Core and RetroArch. I did try to use the Flycast Core and RetroArch for Dreamcast, but it kept getting crashes after a few seconds of play. Because of this, I had to fall back to the Redream emulator, but I think that Flycast would have been the faster option if it had worked. 
When it comes to Sonic Adventure 2, we have some slowdowns that are typical for low power SBCs like this, but the performance picks up in later parts of the game. For those coming from an RK3326, it might not be clear that this is running better than it usually does. You can get similar performance to this on the RK3326, but the games are only running at half this resolution. Let's wrap up things by going over handheld systems, starting out first with GB. For GB, GBC, and GBA, we are going back over to RetroArch. Our final system is Nintendo DS, and we have no issues with the drastic emulator. As you can see, the emulation performance is not that bad, but we can get a whole lot more out of this device if we take advantage of the Wi-Fi 6 support and use it for game streaming. This will greatly expand our options for what we can do on this, and I think it's a better use case for this product due to our LAN support and rather good Wi-Fi chip used in this product. The P2 is fanless, so it's nice to be able to stream games from a bigger and louder PC over to this. That's going to wrap up things for this look at the Station P2. I think this package is great, and I'm already looking forward to further product revisions in this line because I think Firefly is doing a great job when it comes to hardware and software. If you want to buy one of these, there's a non-affiliate link in the description box below. It's a pretty pricey product at the lowest configuration, but it is easy for me to see that a lot of thought and effort went into this product. I think if you can make use out of the many things that this does well, it can be worth the asking price. I don't think it'll be that long before we see gaming handhelds with this chip for around the same price. Anyway, I'm interested to know your thoughts on the P2. Do you like the Station OS and could you see yourself using it? I think the OS Assistant should be on all SBCs going forward because I would love to never have to use my PC to flash new operating systems. Happy gaming everyone. Talk you out.